and I'm going to turn it over to Laura. My name is Robert Ping. I'm with Research Technologies. I do the outreach and training, and I will be in chat sharing some links with you of upcoming things and the place where you can go get the materials after the course. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Laura. So go ahead. Hello, welcome to the uh, Intro to High Performance Computing Workshop. If you're looking for the place to uh, start uh, learning about the various computing systems that we have to offer, you are in the right place. Um, I'm joined by uh, Robert Ping, Lamai Weekly, and uh, other uh, colleagues here at Research Technologies, uh, which is a part of Hewitt's. Uh, we're going to be going over a brief overview of the various systems we have uh, supporting our HPC work here. And then we will do a hands-on portion where you'll all be able to connect to the systems and uh, get started and run your first jobs. Uh, I want to learn just a few things about you all before we get started. Um, if you want to type into the chat uh, how you heard about this workshop, perhaps through the uh, monthly maintenance newsletter or from a professor, uh, whether you're a student, faculty, or staff, uh, what your experience level with HPC is, if this is uh, going to be your first HPC job, or if you've run a few jobs or many jobs, um, what your main computer is currently running, uh, Mac, Windows, or Linux, and how comfortable you are with Linux. You don't need to know anything about Linux uh, before today. Uh, we will walk you all through that. This workshop is a part of the Supercomputing for Everyone series. Um, we've done other workshops in the past, such as a storage for HPC, a statistical numerical software for HPC, uh, covering things like MATLAB and our studio, an introductory parallel programming course so, to help uh, your applications really uh, get the uh, full use of the systems that we have to offer. If you ever need to refresh your memory of what we're discussing today, there is an expand canvas course that you can move through at your own pace that goes over this material and a little bit extra, including those other workshops that I mentioned. At the end of the session, if we don't hit something that you're curious about, uh, leave us a note. If there are any topics that you would like us to offer as a workshop, we also are happy to uh, chat one on one with you all uh, to find out what your specific needs are. All right, I'm seeing a great variety of uh, people and experience uh, levels here. Uh, I think that this will be great. Before we really get started, um, we'll have a little bit of time before we start the hands-on portion. Um, if you don't have an account already on Carbonate, um, you can access the uh, URL access.a.edu accounts create and definitely create an account on Carbonate. Uh, Quartz and Slay are optional. I'll be touching those very slightly. Um, but if you're interested in using those, I would recommend grabbing those as well while you're there. Um, I believe that many of you already have Carbonate accounts. You are all good to go. Uh, if you don't create that, um, and you should still uh, be there in time to do some of the demo work. It does take a little bit of time to populate though. So let me explain what HPC is, what cyber infrastructure is. Um, it's supercomputing and the infrastructure, both the hardware supporting it and the humans that support it around it. Um, for a diverse group of users and fields of study, applying computing to research has become possible and uh, feasible, easier, and it's revealed a lot of new opportunities for study. Computing like this is now really convenient. You can continue using your laptop, doing other things, grabbing a coffee, while knowing that your work is running on hardware that can support it. Uh, some of you may have lots of data, uh, perhaps even terabytes of data that would be difficult to store and work on on your own computers. And we can help solve that problem by prov providing storage options. IU is an HPC center that houses four supercomputers. Uh, we have Big Red 200, which is now currently accepting early users, Big Red 3, Carbonate, and Quartz, Research Technologies, our team maintains and supports those. 
We also have storage, database, and visualization teams supporting uh, work involving those specific parts of it. These resources are all free to you all. Uh, support and consulting from RT is free as well. So if you have any questions, if you're wanting to um, get more into any of these, we are happy to help. Uh, just a few quick facts about the uh, systems that I just mentioned. We have uh, Carbonate and Quartz. Carbonate is our uh, 72, has 72 general purpose nodes, each with 256 gigabytes of RAM, eight data intensive nodes with uh, 512 gigabytes of RAM, and those ones will have 24 cores on those. This is running Red Hat 7, and this is great for memory intensive work that requires a lot of RAM. On Carbonate also, there are uh, some nodes that are equipped with GPUs. Uh, these are the deep learning and GPU partitions. These have NVIDIA P100s and V100s uh, for work that can utilize those GPUs. Quartz is a Red Hat 8 um, operating system machine that has 90 compute nodes, each equipped with 128 cores and 512 gigabytes of RAM. So if you're looking for another location to access those high memory nodes, uh, Quartz is going to be excellent for that. Our Cray systems are Big Red 3 and Big Red 200. These are our flagships. Big Red 3 is our Cray XC40. It has over 900 nodes with 64 gigabytes of RAM, 24 cores that are hyper-threaded, so you can think of them as 48. This is running a uh, Cray Linux environment 7. This is for compute-intensive large-scale applications that require a lot of um, power. Big Red 200 is our newest one. It's an HPE Cray EX running a scientific Linux 15. It's currently accepting early users. Uh, our graduate students, faculty, and staff can request an account by contacting hpsadmin at io.edu. Currently, you cannot do it through the accounts uh, create page that you all use to get your Carbonate accounts. Uh, however, we will be opening that to that page as well soon. The system has 640 dual socket AMD ROM nodes with 256 gigabytes of RAM, 64 core single node. Uh, we have a GPU equipped nodes as well with 64 core single socket ROM nodes, 512 gigabytes of main memory, and four NVIDIA A100 uh, GPU cards. So if you have any GPU work that um, can utilize uh, that much, um, this is fantastic for you. So what do one of these machines look like? What is a node? Uh, you can think of these nodes as its own computer on its own. So when we're saying that Bigger 200 has 640 nodes, Bigger 200 has 640 uh, computers with a CPU, memory, and on some of these nodes, even GPUs. So on each of these nodes, it will have two 64 core CPUs and 256 gigabytes of RAM. Big Red 3 has over 900 nodes with those 24 cores uh, chips on each node. All of these nodes will be able to um, see your files and see the same software stack because um, it is also equipped with high performance networking. This gives you access to uh, our shared HPC storage file systems. Um, so if you have your files stored on our file systems, you'll be able to access it um, on any of the nodes and all of the nodes. They are also able to communicate with each other. So if your application is set up to uh, work across several nodes on Big Red 200, let's say, uh, you will be able to communicate across all those nodes as if it were just one system that you're working on. Um, there's a question in the chat of what are the spec comparisons of an A100 GPU to a 3080? Um, it blows it out of the water completely. These are server grade uh, GPUs. And they also have uh, a software stack. Uh, they have the, the CUDA software stack installed on each one and a uh, supporting a software stack, including your um, TensorFlow and other applications that can utilize those and are built to support them. So then how do you get onto one of these nodes? There are hundreds of nodes to go around, but also hundreds of users and thousands of tasks that those users want to run on those nodes, right? 
This is done with the help of a scheduler that helps manage system resources. Here at IU, we use Slurm. In the past, we've used PBS Torque. Um, many a couple mentions of um, if you've used our systems in the past and you see something that doesn't look quite the same, um, that is just because we have moved from that system to Slurm. How you uh, run your application and how you get the resources you want uh, to run your application is with a job script. So what you will do is you put together the commands that you want to run that you would usually do when you're just running it on your own. You'll add a few Slurm commands that go above those um, commands that you're running to run, um, asking for what, you're, what you want out of your job, how long you want it to run, uh, how many nodes you want, uh, what partition you want it to run in, and then you will submit your job. And once there is an available node that fits what you asked for in your job script, it will run automatically. So you don't have to touch it or anything. Our knowledge base, the KB, uh, has plenty of sample scripts. Um, writing your first job script may seem a little intimidating, but I promise that it's uh, not hard at all. Uh, we have plenty of sample scripts. Uh, another team at Research Technologies, SCA, uh, manages the site called HPC Everywhere that also has a, a script generator for you. So you can type in um, what you would run and also identify what sort of things you want in your job, and then it will help build a script for you. There are several ways. Um, there are several ways to make use of the uh, the CPUs on our system, and all of the nodes on the system. There are ways to make use of several cores or even several nodes at once. But if your job is only looking to use a single core, don't worry. Um, we support these serial jobs. Um, on all of our systems, bigger three, bigger 200 carbonate quartz, they all have multiple cores per node. These nodes are shared among the jobs of a single user. So these cores are not wasted. You can um, stack as many as you want on your node. You can also bundle serial jobs to run in parallel with tools uh, for as long as those resources allow. Tools like PCP and GNU Parallel uh, can help. You can also uh, update your scripts to uh, use those use parallel tools. Now we have a lot of systems. You all are already set up for working on Carbonate, but if your needs ever change, you can request access to Big Red 3 and Quartz the same way that you request them for Carbonate. Again, Big Red 200 is a little bit different, um, but faculty, staff, and students can all request Carbonate and Quartz. Big Red 3 and 200 are limited to faculty, staff, and graduate students. If you're an undergraduate student and you're looking to use one of these systems, uh, I believe that it currently is that you need a, uh, a sponsor, a faculty sponsor to uh, vouch your way in, and then you can start using that. Now, our Carbonate uh, DL and GPU partitions um, are currently limited to uh, those who have workflows uh, that are deep learning or uh, can utilize the GPUs. And we just wanna learn a couple of things about what you're hoping to do with those. Um, so there is a request form you need to fill out, but it's fast, it's easy, promise. Uh, if Carbonate isn't for you and you're looking for uh, the best system for you, uh, HPC Everywhere has a Pathfinder quiz that will put you where you want to be, depending on what sort of work you're hoping to do. So then, why isn't everyone using these very powerful, cool computers? These systems are all running Linux. Uh, they largely use command line interfaces, so it looks very complicated. However, and there are things to learn and it does have a learning curve to it, but it's actually not as hard as it looks, I promise. Um, you just need some basic commands to start. So we're going to start with a short overview and some practical details will show you an easier way to access everything that I show you early on. We have a way to bridge the gap between working on your own laptop and working on the command line. We'll do some hands-on exercises. And then if you ever have a question along the way, you can check out the KB and you can Google for various Unix commands to help you get started. So, since you have a Carbonate account, you also have access to Research Desktop, which is a utility, an application that um, helps us access the HPC systems more easily. 
It provides a familiar way to log in and interact with Carbonate. Uh, it uses ThinLink based on a VNC to provide a remote desktop service on top of Carbonate. You'll be logging into Carbonate, but you get a desktop instead of a command line interface. And we will be using that on our hand-on exercises as well. Once you have uh, access to the systems, you'll want to be able to run software on there, of course. Uh, we have a ton of software already available on the systems. If you don't find what you're looking for, you can install software in your home directory. Installing software can look very different from how you would install it on your own computer, on other operating systems, but we are more than happy to help guide you through it. If you're a professor or a PI and you need your software more widely available, you can submit a request for us to install it in a central software directory where the rest of the, the, the current software can also be found. And you'll be able to do that at a, a request form at rt.iu.edu. Once you have your applications, you'll also want uh, to store your data. We have several teams that uh, help support uh, storage for these systems. The HPFS team maintains and support our Lustre high performance file systems, Scratch and project spaces. We have Slate, which is our quota based and not purged uh, high performance Lustre file systems, which eight, with 800 gigabytes of uh, storage to start, you can get a one time upgrade to 1.6 terabytes. This is excellent for competing against, but you have to request uh, an account to get an account. And you'll do that in the exact same way that you got your Carbonate account. Slate project is a shared space, or it can be a shared space. It's great for if you have collaborators that all need to work on the same data. It's also good for just yourself if you have a lot of data. You can get up to 15 terabytes for free. And then after that, you pay. Um, but uh, it's not a lot. It's not a large cost to go beyond 15 terabytes. Finally, uh, we have Slate Scratch which has a theoretical 100 terabyte quota allotment. Uh, however, files that you don't access within a month are purged. This is accessible on Carbonate Quartz and Big Red 200, but it's unfortunately not available on Big Red 3. So that is the one place where if you try to look for it on Big, if you try to look for Slate Scratch on Big Red 3, you won't be able to uh, view your data there. Research Storage, RS, uh, maintains and supports our home directories, our geode project spaces, and the SDA. Your home directory is where you land once you log in. You will get 100 gigabytes of storage across all of your uh, um, computing accounts. Now, this is all backed up, but because it's a limited space and it's not as high performance as our Slate um, Luster file systems, um, we recommend just installing your software there, but not uh, like computing against it. The SDA is our tape archive. Uh, this is excellent for long-term storage. Data is replicated between here in Bloomington and Indianapolis. So if a disaster strikes, a tornado hits the data center here in Bloomington, it will still be preserved in Indianapolis. So once you are done with your work, you can compress it all and you can place it on the SDA and it will be there forever. So with all of this storage available to you, computing power available to you, uh, how much does all of this cost? It is all free um, for normal use, unless you need huge amounts of dedicated compute time or larger data storage. Our short-term support and consulting is also free. We're happy to help with day-to-day -day issues, installing software, troubleshooting problems. And our long-term support uh, that's more tailored to your needs and consulting is also possible on a paid basis. If you ever need help, uh, we have a variety of email addresses filled with helpful people um, to get you on your way. Um, there are a lot of emails here, but our groups all work closely together, so you don't need to worry about which email to send to. It'll end up in the right place. Um, we have our admins. Um, I am here in research applications. HPFS, which will be managing um, those slate directories is here, SDA, Research Desktop, Red, and SCA um, manages that HPC Everywhere website that I mentioned earlier. So if you have an issue on that site in particular, um, let them know there. 
We also have the KB that should uh, hopefully answer most of the um, small questions that you need. Has plenty of good advice. Uh, if you outgrow us, um, there are supercomputers run by national organizations such as Exceed and Insight, where you can request large, massive allocations. Uh, we can help you with the proposal process. Our biggest users here at IU have used more than 10 million core hours per year. Um, that's a big number. And we hope that you all are able to uh, join us in using our systems. So now that you have your accounts, um, again, if you still need to hop on and grab your Carbonate account, um, you can still do so right here. Um, we will also be using eventually this thin link. You will download the suitable client for your OS for the hands-on exercises at sendio.com thin link download. The site will look like this, pick out the installer for you. When you are accessing our systems, they will have a domain name, um, kind of similar to how you would type into a web browser, uh, carbonate.uits.a.edu, quartz.uits.a.edu. Um, they will have always have domain names that start with the name of the system. Uh, you can always log in with your IU network ID and your passphrase. Uh, generally, you will also have to uh, duo log in just as you would trying to log on to anything else at IU. Uh, you can set up a way to work around this um, with your uh, SSH keys. Uh, once you are logged in, you'll be able to read the message of the day, which has some small messages such as uh, when the next maintenance um, day is. It's usually the first Sunday of the month. Uh, any other small system updates that have occurred or will be occurring. Now, even though these look almost like URLs, if you type carbonate.us.edu into your browser, it won't work. What we use instead is SSH and SCP to log in and transfer data to those remote machines. If you are working on a Linux or a Mac, you have it pretty easily. You have it pretty easy here. Uh, you can use your terminal application and you'll be in in no time. If you're on Windows, you will need some clients to do this instead. Uh, for SSH, you could install PuTTY on Windows. And for SCP, for transferring files, uh, you can use WinSCP or CyberDuck or any other variety. There are KB articles with instructions on how to use these. In addition to this, uh, you can also use Research Desktop. Before we do it the, the Research Desktop way, I'll just show you briefly how to do it from your own terminal. So I'm going to start with SSH. You all can see my terminal over here, okay? Can you get a little bit larger, Laura, so that we can see the text? the font at least. Good call. Yep, OK. So what I'm going to do here is SSH, my username, at carbonate.uits.iu.edu. And ask for your password on Unix machines. It hides the password from you, but I promise that you are indeed typing. And then here, I don't have my SSH keys uh, set up, so I am just going to duo in with my uh, method of choice. And you will see that you are uh, welcomed onto Carbonate. You will see the message of the day. You can see that maintenance uh, will be on April 10th. And when you land here, you can see that you are in your home directory, which will always be n u your username, and then the name of the system that you just logged into. So 
So just a couple seconds to talk about what your environment looks like when you're logged in. Um, again, your home directory will look like this. Now your Slate account, once you have that set up, will be in Slate, your username. It, everyone should have Scratch accounts as well currently. Um, this will be at N Scratch, your username. There are a few useful commands for navigating your environment. PWD tells you where you are. CD uh, lets you change directory. And Quota tells you about uh, how much you currently have stored. It's one of the utilities that we have added to these systems um, to kind of help inform you about what accounts you, what storage options are available to you right now and how much you have stored. So I'm going to change directory into my slate directory. Slate, Lamb Huber. And I have a whole bunch of junk in here. I probably need to do some spring cleaning. Now that you're on the system and you're able to see where you are, um, we will also need some files. So we're going to try and transfer a file from my own laptop to Carbonate. Now I have a file on my desktop and I'll pop it out into a folder because currently Zoom is not showing it if my icon's on my desktop. So I have a file on my desktop called a file. It says, hello. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna open another terminal just to kind of take a look at that there. And all that I'm going to do is I'm gonna go and look at my desktop on here as well. You'll see it's all the exact same stuff. All of my folders are here. And so is my file. All that I need to do to transfer from my own laptop to Carbonate is SCP, a file, just the name of the file. And then I'm going to act as if I am logging in. And then I put a colon right here. And then I just, uh, paste the name of my directory. So I'm going to PWD. I want to look at my current directory. I'm on Slate and I want it there. So I will just put my directory right there. I have to log in again. You can see that it's done there. I will ls a file, it's right there. It is now on my slate directory and I can read it and everything. I'll describe what commands I'm doing in a little bit, but for now you can see that it says, hello. It is indeed the same file. So let's talk about the common file structure on these Linux computers. Uh, you'll see a lot of forward slash, and so you can think of these as defining uh, folders in a tree. So the first one right here, just forward slash with nothing else, that is the root directory where all of these other folders are cascading down from it. From there, you will have directories such as bin, user bin, that contain uh, a lot of your uh, frequently used standard commands and system commands and some other system file locations and temp, which is a dependable scratch areas for programs to use. If you are using R or R Studio, sometimes you'll be writing to here, sometimes MATLAB will as well. Uh, you can also write here too, do note that it is temporary and you can also fill it up, which um, may cause some weirdness and you, generally want to avoid filling it up too much. So we've already accessed Carbonate the normal, the classic way, and we've already copied something to Carbonate, uh, but now we want to access it via Research Desktop, which should make a little bit of this a bit smoother. 
We're also going to change our environment and add some applications for us to run. And finally, we're going to submit a job to the queue to start running something. This is going to cover most of your activities on our systems. So for your first time setup for ThinLink, uh, you can download the client and start the client. You will have a server that you will list as red.uits.ua.edu. You will have a username and password, which are just the same as your usual IU username and password. Uh, if you've installed ThinLink before today, um, I'll get back to this in just a minute once we're uh, taking a look at the options menu, but you'll want to uh, look through the options on the client application. You want to dis disable full screen mode because otherwise, if you're on a laptop like a Mac, it will fill up your whole screen and it'll be really annoying to get out of that. However, there is another way to access Research Desktop. I'm going to go to my browser and unlike trying to type in carbonate.uits.edu, if you type in red.uits.edu, it will actually let you log in. So I'm going to have my username and password. I will log in. Again, it will ask for a duo. Push. And you will be logging into your session. It will populate some of your desktop items right here. And I am logged down to Carbonate through Research Desktop. It looks like your standard sort of desktop system. You have various icons and they do various things. You will find your file browser here and here. For mine, they both go to my home directory. Uh, if you want to look at your slate directory, all that you would have to do is type in N slate, your username. It will think for a second and then it will uh, show all of the items on your slate directory. So you can navigate the file system that way. We also have Firefox available to you. So if you want to download things from Google Drive or Globus, this is also available to you. It will land somewhere on the KB for Research Desktop to help give you a few more um, tips and tricks on how to use this application. HPC Everywhere also has a link on here. So if you just want to go directly to that site and check out the script generator, you can do that as well. Red documentation will also take you through a Firefox link. If you ever have any questions while you're on Red and you want to quickly send us a, an email, you can click this and we will be in contact with you. We will help answer your questions. You will also see a terminal, just like I have here, except for that this one is already on Carbonate. When you uh, check your working directory here, you'll see sometimes that it looks a little bit different, but I promise that it's the same location as your home directory. I will get back to these icons shortly when we start writing our jobs, and I will also get back to the spin drives icon, which will help us uh, move our files a little bit easier as well. There's a question in the chat for how to get to Slate Storage again. Uh, I'll show you in a couple ways. All that you have to do on Research Desktop, if you want to use the click and drag functionality, is you go to in this bar up here. And Slate, your username. You can also do it. Uh, through the terminal here, if you uh, cd change directory, type in the exact same thing, and you will see the exact same stuff.
We do have a lot of the, uh, the common applications that you would want to use visually available here on RED. We have your analytics applications like RStudio and MATLAB. We have some GIS software, uh, performance analysis for looking at your, uh, your code. Uh, we have access to the SDA from here, some basic utilities, and some visualization applications. Down here, we also have a link to our Slack channel. We have an HPC uh, at IU Slack channel that um, our staff does monitor to help answer some of your questions. Finally, we have these, well, we have uh, the trash icon, which generally you do not want to use the trash because it doesn't self-empty. Uh, we instead recommend that you uh, use the RM command on the terminal to, to properly get rid of your files that you no longer need. Um, you can create your own folders on here if you like visually. Uh, you can create a folder here just by right-clicking. You can also open a terminal just by right-clicking. And finally, when you're done with your session, you can disconnect. You, you have two ways of ending, of, um, of leaving Research Desktop. There is one way that completely gives you a fresh start the next time you log in, and there is a way to preserve your session while you're still using it, uh, but you need to move away for a while. So I'm going to uh, work on some RStudio. Hey, Laura, we have a question in chat. Uh, they're asking if there's any storage similar to Box, and if if so, if there's anything like like, can you sync with your computer or cloud storage? Yeah. So you can push and pull files from cloud storage. Um, you can of course use Firefox and go to your Google Drive. There also used to be a way to connect to Box when we had that available at the university for everyone. Um, currently, since we're using Drive, what you would be doing instead is just going to drive through Firefox. Yes, and, and as, sorry, and as Cicada has said in the chat, you, it should be, um, we would not be recommending that you would compute if you did were able to sync some cloud storage, please do not compute off of that. A recommended um, process would be to pull your data onto Slate in, instead so that it's, you know, and on, on the file system, uh, do your computing there. And if you would like to move it back to Google Drive or OneDrive or something that you then, you know, push it there. So yes, um, that would, what our recommendation would be, would to be move your data that's relevant to your computing onto Slate before you do that. And that's actually pretty easy to do here, what you would just download and you could essentially just drag it straight onto your Slate directory. But definitely, definitely do your computing against things that are in this directory. It'll move super fast and it will be uh, a much better, easier experience for you. Now, uh, for, the, for the question of uh, syncing with your computer, again, you will want to only use that to push and pull data to your computer, but we do have uh, thin drives right here. Now, the issue with the web client, um, why you would want to use the thin link client over the web client to do it, um, is that your web client uh, can't do some of the cool things that thin link can allow you to do. So let's say that I am done with my session on here on the web client for now, but I want to return to it later. I have these things running. I can exit in one of two ways. I can use the X right here and it will save everything. My session will still be active. If I'm running something on here that will still be running when I come back, I can also use the disconnect thin link session button here. This lets me leave my current session running and reconnect to it at a later time. 
um, this will not give me a fresh session. So I want to disconnect for now. Now I will be using ThinLink. So you will see some boxes for server, username and password, server, you will want red.uits.iu.edu. If you don't have this advanced button selected, you may not see a couple buttons. Um, if you click advanced and you have downloaded ThinLink before today, uh, I recommend hopping in here and changing your display mode to window. Uh, if you're downloading ThinLink today, you don't have to worry about any of that. There are some other small settings that you can use if you want to and uh, already have SSH keys connected to your Carbonate account. You could select public key here and you can use those instead of using your password to log in. Um, but I still use my password. I want to log in. You will again uh, select the login method of your choice on Duo if you're doing it that way. And you'll see that your session is just as you left it. Now I want to try using my thin drives. This currently isn't set up for me. Uh, what I need to do is log out completely. This will close all of my windows, you'll note. Um, but I want a fresh session to, to go and catch up on all of the uh, thin drive changes that I've made. So I will go into options. I will go to my local devices. I'll go to drives. And I will click these three dots right here. I want to just go straight to my user directory here and click desktop. Now I have a specific folder on my desktop that I would like to see on research desktop to go and push and pull data to uh, slate. I want this one, it's a folder. It's a good folder. It has an image. So what I will do is select a folder I want to read and write to it so I can add things to it later. I will click OK. I will also, just in case, I will end my existing session. Again, this will uh, give you a fresh start, a fresh session. And I will log in. Now, when I click thin drives, I will be able to see my folder. And there's my image. Now, what I would do is that I could, if I wanted to, go to my file browser. And I will just pull it on over. And there, it's on Slate. So there, are, I've shown you a few ways how to um, grab files that you may want um, to your directories uh, for you to use in your work. There is one other way that I can show super fast. Uh, we have a variety of commands that'll help you fetch data from various sources. Wget is your classic for pulling straight from a website. So if we wanted to, for example, grab something from, grab a piece of software from CERN called root, all that we would have to do is in a terminal, use wget, and then just the URL that you're downloading from.
I will use ls to list what I have in there. In that directory, I will ls root star just to um, see all my files that start with root. Uh, and you will see that this is now downloaded. So just to reiterate, uh, mounting your local drive or cloud storage allows you to push and pull your data to and from your local drive or your cloud storage to work with them on our storage systems. Um, these mount connections aren't super persistent and they're not as performant. So we don't recommend computing against them directly in your work because you'll find some weird issues uh, crop up. Um, so your slate space is the place to get your work done. Now that you have your files, now let's go and get some applications in to your environment. There are a few commands to use for this. Uh, we use the module system for managing our software. So if you want to list what software we have already installed, uh, you can module AV or module avail to look at a huge list of what we have. Uh, if you want to look at our various R studios, uh, you just type module avail R studio. Module list will show what's currently in your environment. We do preload some things uh, when you first start up as default. You can module load a package with module load, the name of the package, just like what you would see uh, printed out in module avail. And you can module unload the name of the package. If you like the modules you have and you want to keep them forever and you always want to load them every single time, there is a modules file you can edit in your home directory to make that happen. And just a quick note about the small differences between some of our systems, Carbonate and BigRed3 are using the older module system, while Quartz and BigRed200 are using LMOD, which is a slightly newer update of that. But most of the commands that you might be using uh, should be similar between the two. There shouldn't be too much difference. So let's look at some, uh, let's look at our modules. Look at the software we have available. Module available. Let's take a look at our stat math software. Just for fun, we generally categorize them um, like this on Carbonate and Big Red 3. It'll look a little bit different on Quartz and Big Red 200. Now, when I look at one of these, um, it makes the software available and ready to use. And I, when I load one of them, it makes it available to use, but it does not run it yourself. You have to run it yourself. So I want to see what sort of things our studio will do to my environment if I were going to load it. This is just going to print out what the uh, default R Studio will do to me. It will place it into my path. And it will also load R for me as well automatically. I want to look at other R Studios. I can see what's available with module AV and then the name of the application that you want. So let's go and try some of this out ourselves. We're going to uh, check what modules we have. We're going to see what our environment currently looks like. And we're going to just add an open, open MPI module to our programming environment. So what we're going to do, we're going to see what we currently have loaded. These are all of our defaults. Uh, we're going to look at our LD library path, which lists um, what libraries we have available to us currently. You can print out things with echo. And you'll see a whole mess of items here but not the one we want, which will say open MPI. So I'm going to um, 
module avail open MPI. We'll see a good variety of them. I want this one. If I were to just load module load open MPI, uh, it will just load this one. But just to show you how selecting between all of them works, I will actually copy this one. I will load OpenMPI Intel 2.1.0. It's loaded. We're going to take another look at the library path. And you will see that OpenMPI is there. So you are now able to use um, OpenMPI libraries in whatever you're using. Now, I don't want that one. use module unload to unload it. And then if I just want the default, it will just give me the default. Now let's say that I always want to load this module. All that I have to do is um, I'm in my home directory right now. IVI.modules. Now you can use any text editor that you desire. Uh, I use VI or Vim. However, there can be a bit of a learning co curve to this one as well. So I will show you another way to do this too. Module load open MPI. I'm going to press escape a whole bunch and I'm going to press colon X to save my work and exit. And when I open a new terminal, you will see that OpenMPI was loaded as well. If you don't want to use V and you want to use a more visual way to edit your text files, you can use get it, for example, on Reddit, on a uh, read. <laughs> And you'll see that our modules file was indeed updated. So I'm going to make a small note about um, how nodes are and work on our systems. So there is a login node that you uh, land when you first log in. Uh, Research Desktop essentially works as all being all Carbonate login nodes. Uh, there are also compute nodes. And what you'll usually do on these is you'll build, install, and set up your job environment on the login node. You'll run your job on the compute node, but you won't want to be running software on a login node. You'll only get 20 minutes maximum, and it'll probably cut you off early. And you may um, get, a, get a sad email later on. So generally, the process is build, installed, set up on the login node and run the job on the compute node. Research Desktop is a little bit special. Uh, you can run applications on it right when you log in. You'll get 75 gigabytes of memory, and we ask that you limit to five processes at maximum at once, um, because you do share the nodes with others on these login nodes. If you want your own node, you will need to uh, submit a job. So if you need more power, if you have um, in our studio session that is going to require loading a very large file, for example, um, you can do that through a job on a compute node. So um, we've been going at this for a little while. Does anyone need a break? Or uh, can we continue? I think it's worth mentioning there were some questions in the chat about running software and how a server or something in someone's department may have software package installed. However, if you're trying to run that same software on our 
compute systems, uh, you're going to want to make sure that the same modules are installed, the same packages, et cetera, uh, because it's going to it could be different than what you have installed in your department or or elsewhere. Yep, it will look a little bit different. So if I load up module load SAS and I will SAS. You'll see my SAS environment, but it won't have anything that you have installed on your department computers. So you will just need to do whatever you uh, need to get that on your own session. And they'll you, install that into their own area, not onto the system itself. Correct. Yep. And you can do that in your home directory, or you can do it on Slate, and it should all work fine. I think that's a great spot to take a five or 10 minute break. Yep. And answering the question, does it run faster than your department? Um, it potentially will. You may see some speed up. Um, some of the other motivations for using Research Desktop over your department computers um, and software installations is that you can connect to uh, Slate and our other storage options very easily in case you do have very large files that you need to work on and it's more difficult to um, work on those through your own department services. Yeah, and another, another thought is, you know, Research Desktop is a way to introduce you to some of these concepts and get used to the environment. Um, at a certain point, and Laura will show you an example of submitting a job, um, you can submit a job and in that case you can submit multiple jobs right so you can have once your jobs start running you could have 15 of these jobs for example or more in the queues running instead of um, perhaps just using your computer running a program and then maybe you know uh, your program's using all your memory and then you can't do anything on your computer anymore for example um, this could offload some of that work for you there was a question as well about meta problems with sassing insufficient memory. Will the research desktop have more memory? Um, again, as Laura just mentioned, the research desktop uh, nodes are login nodes and you're sharing it, so you're limited to 75 gigs of memory. If you want more, you can certainly submit a job to Carbonate. The nodes there, as Laura showed in the overview slides, have 256 gigs of memory and 512 gigs of memory. So you can certainly request more by submitting a job that requests more uh, memory instead of running it on, um, on Research Desktop. Yep. So. And okay. is Samba available to mount NSF drives on my Mac? Um, if you're asking about like if uh, you want to mount uh, are, are you asking mounting on research desktop on your Mac or just on your Mac? Yeah. You won't want to mount anything on research desktop itself, but on your Mac itself, you should be able to mount a home directory. All right, let's give Laura a five minute break and we'll come back at 10 after. And you still hold your questions just for a minute and we'll all come back and resume at the same time. Thanks. All right. Where we left off. Um, so we have our applications, we have our data, uh, we have access. Uh, I think that now we are ready to start submitting a job to the queue. So again, as I mentioned, there's a login node and there are many compute nodes and the compute nodes uh, have a lot of uh, power in them. So you build, install, and you set up and you test your job environment on the login node, and then you run your job on the compute node by submitting a job script. Um, our jobs are again scheduled by Slurm and you will use the command srun to launch your parallel or serial applications. 
So it'll look like S run, your number of tasks, which in this case would be 24, and then your app name, or just S run your app name if you're just running serially. Uh, if you've used our systems in the past, um, you may recognize MPI run. Um, that was the old way. S run is the new way on our Slurm scheduled systems. Let's go and grab our materials for running our first batch job. Um, in addition to methods like wget and using Firefox to access your data, uh, you, we also preload git. So you can use all of your git commands if you're familiar with GitHub. We are going to try that here. So let me actually drag a terminal into there. So you can all still see the URLs as I do this. Materials are at https colon colon slash slash github edu. Wait, I'm missing something. <laughs> Let's go back in here. So we're going to go to the directory of our choice, which for me will be my home directory. I am going to actually I'll do it on slate. You can see your module list. See that git is right there. It's already loaded. You can do git clone. Help.iu.edu slash lngyu slash s4es intro to HPC. You will use your IU username and password. So when you look at your directory now. Can you paste that into the chat? Yeah. Here we go. So we are going to cd s4es intro to hpc. We'll take a look around. We'll see a directory job submission. We're going to change directory into there as well. Once you've cd'd into job submission, You'll see that we have a few files here ready to use. Uh, we'll start looking at this MPI hello C um, program. We will be running it with jobscript.slurm. Let's take a look at that MPI hello first. This is a C program that uses MPI to uh, pass messages across the cores that we will be using. It can also communicate across nodes if desired, uh, if you make it do so. 
and it is just going to be saying hello from your task on your node when you are running it on a job. So we can start by just seeing what it does right here. Or, no, we cannot. We must build it first. This is a C program, so we will need to compile it. Since we want to compile it to communicate with other cores, we'll load M open MPI and use MPICC and then the name of the file. So module load open MPI. You will find that if you did change your module file to already have it, then it is actually already loaded. Modules is pretty smart and it won't let you import modules that you already have loaded or modules that have the same name, but perhaps they're a different version. This helps prevent collisions uh, between versions of the same application. So now that we have OpenMPI available to us, we will open, we will MPICC dash O. This will give us a file name if we so desire, MPI hello is what I'll call mine. And, and then we will list the name of the file that we want to compile, which here is MPI hello.c. We will run it. And when we ls now, we will see that we have MPI hello right here. So once you have that, we are going to try running it super fast just to see what it looks like on a login node. You'll see hello from our first task on our red node. When you are accessing the various nodes on the systems, you will find that, such as on here, on red, you can find your node name right here. Mine is I am on i10.red.eots.a.edu. We are going to try running this into a job. So I am going to edit the job script. Let's learn with all the things that I want this job to do. You will see the shebang here at the top is what we call it that uh, just says that we are using bash. So this is a bash script. Now these lines here that start with the hashtag and um, say sbatch, they have a variety of fun letters and words next to them. Uh, these are our uh, Slurm commands. C capital J is going to give us, is going to allow us to type in the name of our job. We're gonna talk, call it test job one. Um, the dash O and dash E let us a title what our output and error files will be called. Um, so this one I want to call job name and then this right here, the um, will let us also pull in from Slurm our job ID. And then I just want to call I just want it to be a dot text file. Here I want the exact same thing, but I want it to be called dot error. I only want one node for this and I only want one task to start. I'm just going to be running it for five minutes. The mail user flag will let me change my username to Lamb Huber. So this will email uh, lambhuber.iu.edu um, when the job begins, if it fails and when it ends. Finally, our partition name, I will explain in just a moment, but we will be running on the general partition. Finally, I'm going to add one last one. If you created your Cardmate account today, you may not be able to do this. So if you created your account today, don't add this last line, but we're going to be adding sbatch 
reservation equals HPC to our S batch directives. And this will let the scheduler know that we are part of a reservation. Since this is a queued system, sometimes you have to wait a few minutes for um, the resources for your job to be available to run. Uh, today, we were able to uh, speed that process along a little bit. We have some nodes just for us. We are going to module load open MPI because that is what our application is using. Now note that again, if you set your dot modules to add open MPI, um, it's gonna throw a little funny error in your error file. So you'll be able to take a look at that, um, but it won't impact anything. Um, we're also going to change to our directory that we have all of this in. Now it is a very long path. So <laughs> what I'm gonna do is We want to go to our directory that our file is in. So we want to change directory to our s yes intro to HPC directory and then job submission. And then we know that our MPI hello is in there in that directory. So we will s run. We only want one task for now, MPI hello. If you were to remove this entirely, it would also just assume, or at least pull from it, your end tasks uh, that you have listed up there. I'm going to press escape on V, press type a colon and press X to save. And then all that I need to do to submit my job script that I just made, sbatch job script dot slurm. It is submitted. And I can see that it has already finished. Let's look at job name dot text. And you can see that it ran on C6, on node C6. You can also see uh, the number of MPI tasks that we ran. We'll also have error output in that directory. So if you were to have errors during your um, session while you were running this on that node, uh, this would be filled with error. So you can see what happened while you were gone. So next, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to say hello from a whole bunch of nodes. We are going to increase that in tasks per node to 12, and we're going to run on 12 tasks our file. All that you have to do is set that to 12, this to 12, S batch And now I have a few more uh, text files in here. I am also hearing dings from my email. So I am also receiving emails for those begun and completed jobs. If you don't want to receive emails, you can, of course, just leave those lines out of your job script. And you can just check your output later. So I will check my output from my new job. And you can see that I'm still, I was able to land on C6 again. If 
you ever need some guidance on how to make a job script, you can always check out the knowledge base or HPC everywhere, and you will be able to um, adopt and adapt these job scripts to uh, your own work. Now that you've submitted with your first um, slurm command, you've done sbatch, now let's do some more slurm commands. That might give us more information on what the queues are doing, what your, how your jobs are doing, uh, what you can do on the system. We are going to look at our partitions that we have available to us. You will see a number of partitions such as our debug queue, which is great for uh, if you want to test something really quickly to see how it would work on a, in a larger job. Uh, these nodes are generally pretty free and available for you to use. There's a time limit of an hour. We have our interactive queue, which is for, um, you would place a job there if you were interested in working on it um, with hands-on without it just running in the background. I'll show you how to do that. We just ran in the general queue. If you need those large memory nodes with 512 gigabytes of memory, uh, you can select in our job script. You would instead type partition large memory and put in how much memory you would like using another sbatch flag. We also have our DL and GPU nodes, our, which I will uh, get into a little more information in a second, uh, as well as debug queues for those, just for you to test and see how your work will work on there. If you need to see how your job is doing, um, we have the SQ command. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make my job run a little bit longer. Maybe that's too much. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is have after my job runs MPI hello, I'm going to sleep 120 seconds. Just have the job run while doing nothing for a little bit. So I have my job submitted. I want to see how my job's doing. SQ dash u flag will let you type in your username to see how just yours are doing. I'll see that my job named chess job has been running for 12 seconds in the general partition on node six with this job ID. This job ID is useful if you need to s cancel. If I can type. Um, and then you would just type out your job ID if you want to cancel all of the jobs that you have as your user all at once, if you realize that your script had something wrong in it or you thought of something else and you need to update what you're running on there, uh, you can cancel all of your jobs with S cancel you, your username. Now, when I look at SQ again, I'll see that nothing is there. If we look at SQ with nothing else added to it, You'll see how all of the jobs on the system are doing. You'll see a couple things here. ST is your status, is your job status. If you have a status of PD that is pending, that means that your job is in the queue and it is waiting for resources, perhaps. All of these are currently waiting for their resources to populate and become ready for use. If you need to see what the limits are on these queues, if you want to see um, perhaps how long you can run on large memory, uh, we've also developed another tool to help you uh, get a better look at what partitions you can run on. Uh, the command Sparta will list out your partitions, how many nodes are in it, uh, if you don't define a wall time, you'll notice on our job script here, 
we asked for a time of only five minutes. If we didn't have that line in there at all, uh, on the general queue, we would get an hour uh, at max. We can run for four days. Timestamps are listed as days, hours, minutes, seconds. You can see how many you can have queued at a time. You can We don't currently have a limit on the general queue for max running. You can see how many jobs are currently running and how many are queued. This is great for if you're looking for some of our more selective nodes, our, our, our more tightly packed nodes, um, to see just how busy they are. And in case you, uh, if you if you do want to just run something very quickly, um, you may want to use perhaps the debug queue or the interactive queue just to maybe not have to wait as long. Now I will give a quick note on the DL and GPU partitions. Oh, these partitions have a GPU equipped nodes. And those are uh, currently open to those who have a deep learning workflows or whose applications can use those GPUs. All that you have to do is go to hvcprojects.eu.edu to request access to those nodes. Uh, we just want to learn a couple things about your workflow, and then you will be able to uh, request those nodes in your job script. GPUs on Big Red 200 are currently available to anyone with a 200 account. We do not currently uh, have you go on to HPC projects to get access to those. So now that we have done our first batch scripts, let's go and run some interactive jobs. Um, these are jobs where you will have a um, instance on the node that you can type in and access and interact with. Uh, these are pretty easy to start. Um, all that you need to do is s run, and then you will add this dash dash pty bash at the end of it. So in order to run one on the debug partition for just a little bit of time, we're going to do that. I'm going to s run debug. I am currently um, in my same directory and I am on C2. This is a different node from the one that we ran our JavaScript on. And this is one of the ones that are in the interactive partition or in the debug partition. We have this job for one hour and while we're in here, we can do a variety of fun things. Now, if we wanted to run, let's say our studio, but we needed more memory. So on Research Desktop, perhaps you are hitting that 75 gigabyte uh, memory cap, you're running out of memory. Instead, what you can do of uh, running on Research Desktop itself, you can start an interactive job through the exact same way. So what I'm going to do is S run. When you uh, do an S run with the dash dash X11 flag, that will let you start an X11 session. We'll also add some tasks for Node just for fun, just to show that you can use all of those uh, S batch commands in here as well. And it should all still request the same things. We'll ask for one hour. And we will add that PTY bash on there. Now you'll see that I am on C71. I'm going to module load R Studio. You'll see that I have already I have loaded the default R Studio. You can see it right there. I'm going to launch our studio from C71. And what 
Slurm is doing in this moment is it is creating a connection from that node to graphically um, deliver the interface for our studio. So if you have workflows that you um, want to do visually, uh, you can still do them and you can still leverage a uh, research desktop as kind of an easy uh, way into running those. We'll close out of that. Uh, any questions so far? All right. So we still have a little bit more time. So I think that we should take a quick visit to Quartz if you have your account. Don't worry if you don't. Um, I just want to show you that you can do everything that I've done right here today uh, on Quartz as well. So we're going to SSH into Quartz two ways. You can, of course, do it through the terminal. Just use this one. Now you'll see that I am still connected to C71 on my interactive job. All that I have to do to exit it is type exit and I am back on I-10. I want to hop on to Quartz super fast. So I'm going to SSH my username. If this is your first time logging onto Quartz from Research Desktop, you may get a small pop-up uh, right above your password um, prompt that says, are you sure that you trust this? You can say yes. We also do have that expand course um, that is vaguely searchable uh, for the topic that you desire. So if you go to expand, Once you go through um, the links to do that, uh, you will be able to, there are section headers that you can uh, click on that'll ha probably have what you're looking for if you're just looking for a specific topic that we covered today. So now that we are on Quartz, I'm just going to very quickly, just for fun, Look at where I am now that I am on Quartz. I am back on my home directory because I just logged in. Um, if I take a look back, you can always walk around a directory backwards by using these two dot dots. You'll see there's Carbonate, there's where we were. And you can still use srun and everything. And I am now on C1 on Quartz on Research Desktop. So Research Desktop can provide a lot of nice avenues to get you started also working on our other machines. And if I close SAS, on your desktop right over here, Uh, there is an icon on your desktop that says other HPC systems. Uh, when you click that, um, you will have access to some handy links to the other systems. 
such as easy file browser access to your directories on Quartz and Big Red 3. We will also be getting Big Red 200 up here soon. We also have these icons that already run SSH, your username, into these systems. So if we wanted to access course this way, you just click that, we'll type in your password. Oh, it's because I had cap lock, caps locks on. That would do it. There we go. <laughs> and you will see again that I am now on ports. So there are several ways to access our different systems on here. Of course, you can do this all in your terminal, but if you're looking for a nice um, middle platform, to both work on your laptop and work on an environment that you're more used to, and then also reach out into our other systems and run jobs on there very easily. Um, Research Desktop can help you do that. As always, um, you can contact us with any questions that you may have as you uh, continue your HPC journey. hpceverywhere.iu.edu uh, has a few resources for you to help uh, start running your scripts and monitor your jobs, look up what software we have available. Uh, are there any other questions? Great, Laura, if there's no other questions, I think we can be done for the day. If you want to stick around for a few minutes in case people are trying to do something and, and they're just not quite ready to ask a question, that would be fine. But to everybody else, uh, we appreciate you attending the workshop. We will send out materials and you can go to those links and the most recent materials will be posted at those links as well as soon as they're available. But Laura, thank you very much. And thank you to the rest of Research Technologies folks who were on chat and on the call today to make the workshop workshop a success. Thank you all.